Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Alyssa Cooper. I'm the chair of the IETF and welcome to the IETF 107 Administrative and Operations Plenary, uh, doing this in our virtual format this week. As, uh, as the slide says, if you're having difficulty joining audio via uh, VoIP, computer audio as it's called in WebEx, you might want to try the option to call in. Uh, there's been a, some issues with audio join today in WebEx, so if you're uh, struggling with that, uh, there's another option for you. Next slide, please. So as with all of our sessions this week, uh, there's a few things that we're suggesting for people and some reminders to help us keep the session running smooth, smoothly. Uh, please turn off your video when you join if you haven't already. Um, having video off uh, gives us a better chance of keeping the session up and reducing the load on the server side. Please mute your microphone unless you're speaking. Uh, if we hear a lot of background noise from you, then the secretariat will, uh, will mute you. Uh, so please try to avoid that. We're going to be using the WebEx chat window exclusively for joining the mic queue. Uh, so typing plus Q into the WebEx chat will allow you to join the queue. Uh, typing minus Q allows you to uh, remove yourself from the queue if you just if you change your mind. Uh, there is a plenary Jabber room, plenary at jabber.ietf.org, which can be used for all other conversation, but we want to try to keep the WebEx chat window exclusively for the queue uh, management purpose. Next slide, please. So here's our agenda for today. Uh, this is the welcome. Following the welcome, we will have a presentation from our meeting host and then brief updates from a number of individuals responsible for different parts of uh, the IETF and its uh, sister organizations. So I'll give one for the IETF itself. We'll have Colin Perkins talk about the IRTF, John Levine for the RFC series, Victor Quarsing for the NOMCOM, Jay Daly and Jason Livingood for the IETF LLC, and Glenn Dean for the IETF Trust. And we will try to keep all of those uh, quite short. We know that it's an odd hour, lots of uh, different places in the world. So we'll keep it brief. Next slide, please. And then we'll move on to our open microphone sessions, starting with the IETF Administration LLC. Um, and then for the Internet Engineering Steering Group, we will recognize our outgoing members and do an open microphone session. And then uh, the same for the Internet Architecture Board. Next slide, please. So uh, first, I'd like to extend a uh, deep appreciation to our meeting host, Huawei. Uh, they've made an extraordinary commitment uh, to the IETF in continuing to support this meeting, even though we had to um, convert it from an in-personal meeting to virtual. And so we are uh, truly appreciative uh, for that continued support, um, despite all the changes and um, uh, a lot that had to happen behind the scenes and, and at the last minute to make it uh, make it go off. So uh, we really appreciate uh, them uh, sticking with us through this whole process. Next slide, please. And I will turn it over to Ryan for the host presentation. Um, thank you, Alisa. Uh, so can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, everyone here. Uh, my name is Ryan. And I'm the head of the ITF account team of Huawei, uh, which coordinates the IT, uh, Huawei's activities in ITF community. So as an ITF 107 virtual meeting host, and probably being the first virtual meeting host in ITF history, I guess, uh, I'm honored to have a brief speech uh, in this meeting. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all ITF participants and the ITF chair, AOC, IESG, for the great work and arrangement, even in these very difficult times when the COVID-19 virus flooded in the world. And we still can gather together to make progress, follow the ITF open and the cooperation principles, and never stop supporting the mission and the goals of the IPTF community, which is make the internet work better. Secondly, uh, I would like uh, to share some pity and uh, surprise to you all. You know, uh, together with AOC, we had very carefully planned for the IETF 07, including welcome reception, a great social event, 
customize for the supplement and also the design of the T-shirt for the 107. This proposal of this preparation was to provide a, a remarkable experience to all ITF 107 participants. But unfortunately, due to the implication of the virus, all this work cannot be realized. Although the goal of the remarkable ITF 107 is somehow achieved through virtual way. Uh, so please, uh, can you see the slides? Yeah, this one, I, I just wanted to show uh, you the social event as an example. Um, together with ALC, we really carefully planned the, the, the social event. We choose a, a very great, a great uh, venue for uh, this is a Grounds Mountains Resort. And in this venue, we can have a lot of uh, activities like uh, ice skating, snowshoeing, and skiing. And even we uh, planned a great show, uh, which is a sandbox drawing, try to describe the over 30 years history of ITF community. This here just to show as an example. And the next page, please. Yeah, this is uh, the 107 t-shirt design. Uh, you can see the back of the t-shirt. Uh, there is a Chinese towel, uh, which re is really to match the ITF community towel guidance meaning. That means the people should, uh, should uh, cooperate with each other. Okay, so anyway, uh, although um, although this uh, the meeting is converted to a version one, but uh, the fabrications of the ITF 107 t-shirts is still ongoing. With the help of the AOC, we will be able to distribute them to all the ITF participants during the next ITF in-person meeting. Okay, so uh, again, for every ITF participant, we uh, really would like to thank you all. And we all believe that uh, the implication of the virus will stop soon based on the efforts of the all of the world. And uh, uh, as well as by the ITF community. So please take care and be safe and healthy. We hope that we can meet uh, at the next uh, ITF in-person meeting. Thank you. That's the end, Alisa. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it. So next is uh, the report from myself. We can go to the next slide. I just have two topics today. The first is uh, talk a little bit about the conversion from the in-person uh, meeting as planned to this virtual meeting and uh, then brief note about our participant statistics. Next slide, please. So um, there's some humor going around the internet about uh, virtual meetings as the entire world has uh, moved its work to uh, video conferencing, it seems. And when I saw this cartoon in particular um, earlier last week, I sort of thought to myself, this could be us. It's it's possible that at the end of that I, the virtual IETF, we could think to ourselves that really we could have done everything by email. And we do so much by email anyway. Um, but I think, at least in my personal opinion, up to now, uh, the, the first half of the week, um, the meetings themselves have been um, quite useful and productive, and uh, we did get some things accomplished that we couldn't have uh, accomplished, uh, certainly not as quickly, over email. So I think um, the virtual meeting is um, uh, proving some of its usefulness, at least. Next slide, please. So in converting from the in-person meeting to the virtual, we had um, not a lot of time to plan and many constraints just to tick through a few of them. Um, major one is time zones. We are spread all over the world. And uh, while well, that means that when we have an in-person meeting, different people experience jet lag differently, we have a, a totally different set of challenges, um, uh, not related to jet lag, but to what time it is uh, at, in different places when people are joining. Um, and that uh, doesn't have any uh, easy solutions, obviously. We had already worked out the working group and, and research group conflicts uh, for the in-person meeting, and that is always a, it's a challenge every time um, uh, with a regular meeting. And so figuring out what to do in terms of conflicts uh, was not straightforward. We had the notion that the amount of time needed for some of the virtual sessions might differ from what we had planned for the in-person meeting, uh, just because the nature of the interaction is different. 
So we had to think about that. We had to think about the uh, impact of the virtual meeting on the non-com requirements um, as spelled out in RFC 8318. Uh, we've had some further discussion about that um, even just today in the in the Gen Dispatch meeting. Um, but this has implications because the non-com requirements are very much uh, rooted in the notion of having three in-person meetings per year. And then we had to think about web conferencing technology, um, which uh, everybody I'm sure has lots of opinions about and experiences with. So there was a lot, a lot to kind of balance and, and not a lot of time uh, because we uh, made this decision to switch to virtual um, not too long ago. So as people I think are aware, uh, some people are aware, we reduced our schedule uh, pretty significantly to put emphasis on um, groups that really needed uh, bootstrapping, uh, BOFs, uh, dispatch groups, and um, working groups that would be meeting for the first time uh, to give them the benefit of that real-time interaction and participation from across the IETF's areas uh, that new groups uh, need in order to establish themselves as opposed to existing groups, which might be a little bit more accustomed to working via email and having interim meetings and so forth. In terms of the timing, we anticipated having relatively few participants uh, in the part of the world between um, Europe and China. And so this schedule aimed to give uh, what we expected to be the bulk of the participants an opportunity to experience some version of nighttime, um, perhaps a little bit more on the earlier end or, or the later end of that, but at least um, you know some dark hours where we weren't um, having meetings scheduled. Um, and we thought if you know, we're asking people to join meetings multiple days in a row, that that, that was pretty important for everybody's um, ability to participate effectively. With that said, um, a deep respect for people who are joining us from India, from the Middle East, um, from elsewhere, who are working through the night, um, people who are dealing with family commitments on the side, who are staying up late, getting up early in order to uh, progress the work of the IETF. Uh, we know that that's a serious commitment um, and it's, uh, it's not ideal. Uh, and we, we definitely appreciate um, that people have, have made some sacrifices in order to be able to participate. Next slide, please. So I also wanted to just share a personal note, actually two personal notes, um, reflecting about this experience of uh, the virtual meeting. I wanted to extend specific appreciation to Alexa Morris from the IETF Secretariat uh, and to Jay Daly and Greg Wood from the IETF LLC. Um, these three together with the Secretariat staff have worked tirelessly over the last two weeks to make this meeting happen. Uh, there's an incredible amount of work that had to happen behind the scenes in order to get all of this in order. Um, and I think the four of us have really uh, worked together uh, just impeccably as a team and it's been uh, really an uplifting experience to be able to work with them and um, for them to do uh, such an amazing job. So uh, drop them a note or next time you see them in person, which I hope won't be too long from now, um, uh, please extend your thanks to them because they've they've just done an amazing job. I also wanted to just take a moment for us to uh, collectively marvel at how the internet's ability to connect people is really a bright spot in what is otherwise a fairly dark time, uh, I think, as everybody recognizes, it seems like a, a large part of the world has experienced both the joys and the pitfalls of video conferencing in recent weeks, um, many people for the first time. And more broadly, the internet is allowing people to connect in so many ways, and in some cases that are critical and, and life-saving ways um, uh, in a very difficult time, even though they are uh, have to be physically separated. And that's something that our community and everyone who has worked to build the internet um, should be proud of, that, that we're making a contribution to, um, uh, to people's lives in a really meaningful way. I think it also kind of gives some renewed purpose to our mission here, which is to make the internet work better. Um, we have the opportunity to channel all of the anxiety and uncertainty and confinement that we're experiencing right now into continuing to improve the network uh, upon which the entire world is relying in a really serious way. And so that's something that I know I'm grateful for and that we all can be grateful for, that we have purpose, we have mission, um, and we can continue to work in service of it. So I'm, I'm glad that we can share that together. Next slide, please.
With respect to the future, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, weighty, difficult conversations to have um, about uh, how the virtual meeting experience um, impacts us. And there's a, a number of different threads that have already emerged. So the first one I have here on the slide is about scheduling um, in light of time zone constraints. Uh, this is, as I said at the top, a, a very difficult uh, task. It uh, always disadvantages some people. Um, we've had this conversation in the context of physical meetings as we move them around to different geographies, but it's not it's not really the same uh, uh, issue set of issues to tackle. Um, so in the IESG, we've been talking about this a little bit. We were you know, much more focused on 107 than on the future um, for obvious reasons. But uh, we will be kicking off some discussion about this in the near future, and we'll let people know, uh, you know, which list is is the list where we intend to do that. Um, we're hoping to get that organized uh, in fairly short order. The next one is eligibility for uh, the 2020-2021 NOMCOM. So this is the NOMCOM that will be seated um, this year. There's a discussion thread that's happening uh, about that on the IETF at IETF.org list. And we're asking people to comment in that thread by April 30th. This is a topic that has a very short fuse because the NOMCOM needs to be seated uh, uh, in the first half of this year. And the eligibility criteria uh, state that one has to have attended three out of the last five IETF meetings in order to be eligible. So we need to figure out how IETF 107 fits into that. Um, the next one is about eligibility for future NOMCOMs. So um, also NOMCOM related, but this is a distinct topic because it uh, doesn't have that short uh, time frame as it does for this year's NOMCOM. But nevertheless, uh, uh, this clearly, the developments in the world clearly um, throw a wrench into the way that we've traditionally established NOMCOM eligibility and we need to figure that out. And so for the time being, this discussion is uh, based on the Gen Dispatch session that we just had. We'll continue on the eligibility discuss uh, list. And then there are many, many other considerations for all virtual meetings uh, related to uh, technology and hallway and replacing the kind of socializing that we normally get to do and side meetings and um, all kinds of other things. And the list where that discussion has been uh, going on is the many couches list at IETF.org. So I encourage everybody to um, check out all of these different discussion venues. I know it's kind of a lot. Um, there's what well, we're trying to uh, sort of segment the problem because there's many dimensions to it. So appreciate um, folks chiming in on the on the various uh, lists and threads if you have um, thoughts, opinions, and experiences to share. Next slide, please. So 107 participant statistics. Uh, I thought some of you might miss this slide if we didn't have it. So I tried to format it the same way that we normally do, but we are not uh, actually sharing the participant statistics midweek as we normally do um, because we are going to calculate how uh, how we count um, who attended in a different way since we're running a virtual meeting and we you know you didn't have your registration tied to check in or anything like that that we normally do in a in a face to face meeting. So we will be um, posting participant statistics and updating the community about what the participation looked like at this meeting, but we're not prepared to do it uh, during the meeting week as we normally are. I'd also just, uh, again, remind people to register if you are attending remotely and you um, and you didn't register already. Again, you don't, strictly speaking, have to do this in order to join any of our WebEx sessions, but it will help us to get a, a sense of, of numbers and hopefully be able to compare in some reasonable way um, with other meetings that we've had in the past. So please register if you haven't already. If you were registered for the in-person meeting, um, you have been converted into a remote participant already and you don't need to register. But um, if you never registered, uh, then we'd like, we'd like for you to register, so please do. Next slide, please. There's much more covered in our report that we have posted online from myself and from the IESG uh, we received one appeal in the last cycle, uh, which we've just uh, posted a response to within the last day. Um, and there's lots more reports from um, other groups associated with the IETF. Um, so if you take a look at the meeting materials, not all of the reports will be posted yet, but um, some of them will be posted soon. Uh, and there's always more um, uh, content on the blog if, uh, if people want to check that out. 
I think that's it for my report and we can move on to the IRTF. So Colin is up next. Uh, thanks, Alyssa. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, this is the Internet Research Task Force uh, Plenary Report. Uh, my name is Colin Perkins. I'm the IRTF Chair. Uh, next slide. Um, so the IRTF is a, a parallel organization to the IETF that provides a, a home for, for longer term research work um, that relates to the, the evolution of the Internet protocols, applications, architectures and technologies. The IRTF is organized as a set of research groups. Uh, none of the groups are actually meeting this week. Um, those shaded in dark blue on the slide have been scheduled uh, or are planning to schedule uh, virtual meetings during the, the next few weeks. Um, so if you're interested in any of those topics, uh, please do look out for, for those meetings uh, and try and attend over the next few weeks. Next slide, please. Um, the uh, uh, in, in the IRTF, uh, rather than holding boffs to form new research, form new research groups. Uh, we, we charter new work as proposed research groups that meet for a year and then undergo a review to determine if they'll continue. Um, I'm very pleased to note that the, uh, the computation in the network group uh, had its review in Singapore and was approved as a full research group in December. And the quantum internet group has just finished its review and has uh, just been approved as a full research group earlier this week. Uh, they're both doing some really nice work, so, so look out for their meetings and look out for the meetings for the rest of the research groups coming up over the next month or so. Next slide. In uh, addition to the research groups, uh, we run the Applied Networking Research Workshop uh, in conjunction with ACM SIGCOM. The 2020 edition of this workshop uh, is planned to take place in July. Uh, Miria and Roland are organizing that, uh, and hopefully it'll take place in, in person in Madrid. Uh, the call for papers for the, the workshop is available on the website. Uh, the submission deadline is the 10th of April. Um, and if you've got any interesting uh, applied networking research, then please do uh, consider submitting to that workshop. As I say, we're, we're hoping to run this as an in-person event in Madrid. Um, if we succeed in doing that, there will be travel grants available. So um, if, if you're a student, uh, look, look out for the student travel grants, uh, which are available on the website. Um, if we fail to do that, we'll be holding the, the workshop online instead. So, so pl please do uh, consider submit, submitting your applied networking uh, research work. Next slide. Okay, uh, finally, uh, the final thing we do, uh, we run the Applied Networking Research Prize uh, in conjunction with the Internet Society. The prize is awarded for recent results in applied networking research that are relevant for transitioning into uh, the Internet standards and into shipping Internet products. We had three uh, really interesting talks planned for this meeting uh, from Renisha, from Georgia, and from Ingmar. Uh, and unfortunately, we had to postpone them due to the, uh, the, the cancellation of the in-person meeting. Uh, we're hoping to bring the winners to one of the in-person IETF meetings later in this year, um, so they can give their awards uh, then and part participate in the meeting. Uh, if that's not possible, we'll be doing the talks at one of the future uh, IRTF open meetings on online. In the meantime, though, uh, the links to the uh, award-winning papers are on the slide, so please do take a look some really nice work there uh, and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll we'll see these people in person later in the year and if not look out for the talks uh, online later on thank you thank you next up we have john levine uh, hi thank you next slide please um i'm going to give you the short update about as the temporary rfc series project manager next slide please um, the, the last full-time, or at least last uh, full RFC series editor resigned at the end of last year. So I'm here for a year and a half holding the fort. And the, uh, the normal RFC duties are currently split between the RSOC and me. Next, please. I'm pleased to report that the production of RFCs is, uh, is, is still continuing. We now have 100 RFCs published in XML. Um, it's it's been slower than we expected because even though there was there was a lot of work done on the tools before they started, not surprisingly, since these are new tools in a new format and, and 
and that there has been a lot of um, bugs found in the tools, particularly with the uh, making the HTML and PDF output look nice. Um, there's been some issues with the XML vocabulary, um, and that's slowed things down a lot. Um, one of the things that I'm scratching my head about and that I need to I need to socialize some is the question that since the XML is what is considered canonical and the PDF is derived from that, um, is it, would, it, would it be worth considering the possibility of putting up with less than perfectly beautiful PDF for a while so we can fix the tools and re-render re the non-canonical stuff? Um, I'm specifically not proposing that. I'm just saying it's something to think about. Um, the, the service level agreement um, it has been on hold since the switch to the new tools. Um, it's clearly going to stay on hold so long as we're dealing with the COVID outbreak. Most of the people working off of the RFC production center work remotely. So at this point, we're not calling into their meetings and they still seem to be not as productive as you would hope. But at this point, it would be foolish to make any promises. Next, please. We came up with a new vocabulary for the V3 XML, which, um, which we have been using. Um, as we've gained experience with it, um, we've made some changes to the X, to the um, to, to the XML to deal with problems that, that came up, or, or uh, not so much problems that came up, but the sort of formatting and content issues that we hadn't anticipated. Um, the change process has not been managed as well as I as as it might have been. In particular, the documentation of the changes to the vocabulary are way behind the, the code and the tools. Um, I'm working on that with, um, with with the people involved. At some point, we'll have to figure out when the changes are done. Uh, we can say yes, this is version 3.1. And then we may go back and retroactively consider whether some of the changes um, don't necessarily make sense for a series for for documents that are supposed to be archival and be you know and be be possible for people to read and re-render 30 or 40 years from now. Next, please. Another big change is um, internationalization. In most places, um, I wouldn't say allowed in most places. But what I'm trying to say here, um, author names and, and addresses can now be include Unicode. So if you are, you know, so if your name is natively written in Chinese, uh, we, we can now put that in the RFCs along with the English. And it, there are limited other places where um, where non-ASCII characters are allowed. Um, technically, so putting Unicode into HTML or PDFs is not hard, give or take layout of mixed scripts, which is actually terribly hard, but there's libraries that deal with that. Um, the, the most difficult thing is that is to, is to proofread stuff. I mean, if it's just a few characters that are not in English. Um, those are fairly straightforward to go, but straightforward to deal with. But we don't have anybody on staff who can, you know, who has skills in non-English languages good enough to proofread non-trivial non, non chunks of text. So again, that's something, there's certainly plenty of people who speak lots of languages here in the ITF. This should not be a problem that we can't solve, but it's one we need to think about. Next, please. And that's it. Great, thank you, John. Victor is next. Hello? Hey, we can hear you. Oh, perfect, okay, next slide, please. Um, I'll just make this a uh, brief update from the NOMCOM for 2019-2020. Uh, next slide, please. So we had, um, from last year into this year, we've we seated in 105. We um, then had a call for uh, nominations. We conducted the interviews in IETF 106 uh, back in Singapore, and we've had all the selections completed and um, approved from the various confirming bodies um, as of the end of January. And so now the NOMCOM is moving into quiet mode, uh, pending um, any needed interim selections that may come up until the next NOMCOM is seated. Next NOMCOM, please. Oh, sorry, next slide, please. Um, once again, this is a quick list of the voting members and the non-voting members, including the liaisons and um, other helps. Uh, we had tremendous positive um, participation this year, and I was very, very thankful to have such an energetic and um, engaged team. So thank you very much to the NOMCOM members. Next slide. Here is a uh, list of the results from the ISG, the I, um, ISG selections, the IAB selections, um, the LLC, and the trust. 
So uh, we send our congratulations out to those uh, who were um, nominated and were confirmed and hope to see great things from them. Next slide, please. We wanted to also thank the community. Um, the NOMCOM was very happy with the tremendous support we had in terms of comments, people visiting the NOMCOM rooms um, over 105 and 106. Uh, we had a lot of feedback. It was great to see, and we were able to utilize that as we went through our deliberations and uh, were able to come up with uh, our selections. So thank you for everyone. And I wanted to make a special thank you to Scott, who was a tremendous, great past chair and helped me out quite a bit. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of the next NOMCOM chair, that selection is still in progress uh, by the ISOC president. Um, it will be a challenging year, so hopefully, you know, someone brave will come up to bat and to help us as this year comes up as we move through uh, for the next round of selections. Next slide, please. And I guess another call to action, we, we kind of say similar things uh, each time. Uh, one of the things is um, we want to remind folks, please put your uh, hat in the ring. If uh, uh, as a NOMCOM volunteer, it's a taxing, but an incredibly uh, rewarding experience. You learn a lot about the ITF as you go through the process. Obviously this year might pose an interesting way to select the volunteers, but um, please put your name in the hat. Sorry, put your hat in the ring. Uh, in terms of uh, for positions, uh, one of the things we've battled this year is uh, many years is some positions we had fewer than desirable in terms of the number of nominees. We would love to see more qualified folks um, in future nomcoms put their um, put their names forward. Um, we did try to simplify the questionnaire this year. Uh, we believe that had some positive momentum, and we did we definitely focused in on. Um, uh, making sure we utilize the review period to be able to dig in. So we appreciated all those who did put their names forward. And we definitely, um, as a community, would love to see more people be able to put their names forward um, in the future. And uh, please uh, provide your support to the next NOMCOM chair, um, as this will be a very interesting year coming. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. I think. I think there is someone who has a question for you, Michael Richardson, if you don't mind taking a question. Uh, so I wanted to know if any of your voting members were exclusively remote. Um, and I wanted to know if if you had to do any uh, interviews where you had a mix of remote and local uh, voting members or candidates. Uh, good question. So the answer was yes, we did have uh, one of our voting members who was unable to attend. And we modified the deliberations um, and we were able to have them participate. The particular challenge we had was we had one individual it's remote and all the others were in the room, but we definitely were able to find a way to make that work. Um, everyone was very cooperative and it can be made to work. It requires that the in-room folks are diligent in listening to the remote folks and make sure that we provide them opportunity to speak and, and provide input. So yes, we were able to make that work. In terms of interviews, we did have a few interviews that were remote, um, where both the interviewers were both in the room and we had remote interviewers join, or that, that one individual uh, join remote, and we were able to make that work as well. It took preparation, it took cooperation from the team, but it, it, um, we did find a way to make it work. Do you need special support from the Secretariat? Um, in this particular case, uh, the standard tools that they provided were sufficient. Uh, we had the WebEx um, uh, dialing capabilities, which we utilized. Uh, the one the one tool that one of our voting members brought, we utilized was an in-room uh, um, speaker uh, mic system, which wasn't part of the standard toolkit, but something that one of the members had, which was that helped make it work. So I think most of the tools we used were all standard. Um, but there was a couple of items that we kind of MacGyvered. Um, sorry, I shouldn't use that term. There was a couple of things that we made work on our own to kind of uh, work through it. So um, not too much additional tools from what we had. Did that uh, um, answer your question or did I not quite hit the mark? You got it. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Victor. We can move on. The ITF administration LLC. Okay, and Jason. 
Thanks, Alyssa. I'll start. Next slide, please. And next slide as well, please. So I want to start off by thanking um, Huawei. They made our life um, considerably easier. Um, as uh, I mean, it's it's a very large investment that Huawei put into a meeting like this, and they were very helpful indeed about um, uh, all of the difficulties that we encountered, and they've continued to sponsor the virtual meeting, um, which is um, fantastic. So thank you very much, Huawei. Next slide, please. Um, we have two other um, meeting sponsors as well who um, took the plunge to sponsor a virtual meeting. So um, CIRA, the um, uh, registry for .ca, and um, Verisign, the registry for .com, .net and others. So thank you both very much for continuing to um, sponsor this meeting. It's made our life considerably easier. Next slide, please. And a special shout out to TELUS, who put in an enormous amount of work for us to have connectivity ready at Vancouver, which of course we're not using, but we still want to recognize the um, significant work they did. So thank you very much, TELUS. Next slide, please. And we continue to be supported by our equipment sponsors, um, Cisco and Juniper Networks, thank you very much. And of course, we're all using Cisco WebEx now, which is um, donated by Cisco for us to use. Next slide, please. So our sponsors have been um, fantastic in this regard. Um, some, as, you, as I've said, have sponsored this meeting. The others have all agreed simply to shift their sponsorship to IETF 108. Um, so thank you to ICANN, thank you to Akamai, and thank you to Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. Um, that's been very simple, very painless process. And also a special thank, shout out to Comcast who uh, sponsor us across the whole year so we can put their funds against any meeting we want to. Next slide, please. Um, there was still a code sprint, um, albeit virtually, held on Saturday. Um, and so uh, thank you to the contributors here who were able to participate. And next slide, please. So IETF 108 Madrid. Um, of course, there are still concerns about um, this going, but um, we want to uh, thank Ericsson for being willing to host this. And we still have sponsorship opportunities available. So please do contact us about this. Next slide, please. And finally, um, thank you to all of our global hosts, Cisco, Comcast, Ericsson, Juniper Networks, NBC Universal, and Nokia. Um, we really do have some very committed um, global hosts who are willing to make a long-term commitment to us. And without that, we really would um, have a much harder um, struggle to find money on our hands. So this, is, um, uh, this ongoing support from these hosts is vital to us. Thank you. Next slide, please. future meeting venues for you. Um, we are um, we'll probably have a couple more to announce soon after this meeting. Um, as you can see, we have two further to go in 2020. Um, uh, uh, Madrid and then on to Bangkok. And then next year, we're moving on to Prague, San Francisco, and then some more still to be announced. Um, we are quite well advanced on negotiating some of these, but with the um, current issues, um, our meetings team are unable to travel and look at further venues. So we may be a little bit delayed in telling you about um, venues beyond this. Next slide, please. And meeting snapshot. Um, the, we had 703 people um, who had paid for attendance. And for remote participants, we've just taken a guess here. As Alyssa said earlier, we don't really know. We've had um, over 200 in some sessions, but we haven't yet done the work to understand um, whether it's the same 200 um, turning up all the time. Next slide, please. So I'm now going to hand over to Jason Livingood um, from the LRC board. Thank you. Great, thank you. Hopefully uh, you can hear me okay. Jason. Great. All right. So uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, joining. 
Um, our board remains the same as it has been the last few meetings. Um, all of the folks shown here are uh, in the meeting today as well, which uh, is convenient. Um, next slide, please. Um, we publish, um, as usual, our upcoming board meetings. Starting in January, we moved to a monthly board meeting cadence um, with uh, some increase in frequency um, prior to uh, decision making around uh, the Vancouver venue and whether we would continue with the uh, virus and so on. So there was some increased frequency right around that time, but we're getting back to our monthly cadence, um, at least for now. Our next meeting is tomorrow, so feel free to join that meeting virtually. We'll all be remote, obviously. And uh, then thereafter, um, for now at least, we'll have a monthly cadence, although uh, you know, the subject to revision uh, for more frequent meetings you know, as needed based upon how um, things evolve here with the uh, situation. Um, next slide, please. So some of the work that we've recently completed, we finished our uh, fiscal year 2020 budget since our last November meeting, uh, TF-106. And uh, that's in place now, of course. Um, I'll talk about the finances later on in, in a moment with some caveats there. Uh, we finalized and implemented an investment policy statement, which is a, a fancy way of just sort of saying, what's our strategy for investing funds and the mix of assets or types of investments that the money would go into and so on. Uh, so that's complete as well. Um, in uh, January, we had a strategic planning retreat in Washington, D.C., and uh, did that for a couple of days. That was very productive. And um, we uh, published the ITF director's goals for 2020. Um, that was published, uh, I think, late January, early February. And uh, finally, we updated our board meeting minutes policy um, to ensure that uh, those board minutes would you know, be published within a couple of weeks of a board meeting. And that was something that just sort of fell between the, uh, fell in the cracks, you know, as we moved from um, twice a month to uh, uh, once a month meetings. Next slide, please. So things that we're currently working on, and uh, the first one here is uh, going back to look at our formation documents. Um, there's, uh, there were a few things there. Number one, we had to sort of communicate back to them um, that we had completed some uh, compliance sorts of things, you know, set up policies and, and so on. Um, and then, uh, you know, the financial commitment they've made was really for the first two years. So this fiscal year is the last one in that formal agreement and the uh, formation documents specify that we uh, come to some, you know, ongoing continuing agreement uh, sometime this year. And we've started that process of uh, working on some of those numbers. So that remains a key work item for us to ensure long-term uh, financial stability. And then the second item is uh, completing our fundraising and sponsorship strategy. This was one of the primary work activities that uh, was the focus of our January retreat. And uh, we're continuing to work on that um, this year, the first half of this year in particular. Um, of course, as we look at longer term investments um, to fiscal year 2021 and beyond, um, we're looking at um, other areas that might need investment, um, especially with the prospect uh, or potential of more remote uh, meetings and interims and so on, um, looking at uh, where investment might be needed incrementally and figure out how to factor that into future budgets. Uh, obviously, much will be learned from this virtual meeting um, that will inform that. So. Um, more to come on that. And then uh, policy compliance program, uh, more to come here. Essentially, once the policies are in place, that's all well and good, but people have to be trained or informed about the policies so they understand them, and then they have to be checked up on. Um, so more uh, will come there, um, such as the whistleblower program and so on. Next slide, please. So this is our a quick snapshot of the current fiscal year, and I will offer two important caveats here. Number one, this is only reflective of one month of the operating year, um, since we've only closed out uh, and published the January numbers, um, at least in the top part of the balances. And so obviously the, the meeting hasn't taken place yet. Really, we have three you know main uh, financial events associated with the meetings every year. So. Um, you know, that's normally the case, of course, with this extraordinary um, change of, you know, venue from Vancouver to virtual, um, there'll be, 
you know, significant financial impacts. Um, luckily, as Jay related via email, um, it, you know, we've got insurance that will cover some of that and we're in the process of going through that. So we won't know for a little while what the full financial implications will be. Um, but uh, when that becomes available, certainly Jay will communicate that out. And, um, you know, as needed, this is obviously why we have reserves and we can dip into those reserves as necessary. So um, we are well positioned financially and stable. Next slide. And of course, you know, typical contact uh, information applies here. And uh, the one note at the bottom is that we've now have this uh, new URL for uh, whistleblower concerns. So you can submit uh, your concerns that way if you wish. That's really the only new addition here compared to uh, the slides previously. Next slide. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you both. We had a couple people join the queue, uh, but assuming that these are questions for um, either Jay or the board, we will be having the LLC open mic just after the ITF trust presentation. So I would ask you to stay in the, we'll keep you in the queue and come back during the open mic, unless that's a problem for anybody. And with that, I think we can move on to the ITF trust. Hi there, Alyssa, can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. Hi there, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so these are the five ITF trustees. Uh, like the LLC, we are a group that's stuck together. Uh, uh, I is, uh, was the NOMCOM appointee again this year, uh, and uh, Stefan Wagner was uh, reaffirmed by the um, IESG. So we got to stay together, which was actually very good for the trust because we don't have to spend the money to re-register all of our uh, registrations that are actually put under people's names, uh, the way things are organized. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, the ITF Trust is essentially in charge of the trademark copyrights and software licenses for the ITF, the ITF community, the internet community. Um, this means practical things like if you want to put the ITF logo on a t-shirt, you need to come to us to get a license. Uh, those are my fellow trustees, uh, Joel Halpern, John Levine, Kathleen Moriarty, who's also our treasurer, and uh, Stefan. Next slide, please. So uh, 2019 was actually a pretty busy year for us, which is very unusual because the trust is usually a very quiet activity. Um, one of the big things we did was we completed the IS2 transition. Uh, that meant uh, in practical sense that in the past, all the trustees had been uh, the IOC members. And when we did away with the IOC and replaced it with the LLC, uh, the trustees actually split off from that, and for the first time, we actually brought on a bunch of uh, brand new trustees uh, that had not been IOC members, and, and we got together and we had to complete that transition. Uh, one of the things we also had to complete was we lost uh, our, our executive director who had previously been a member of the trust and was able to do some of the administrative work. Uh, we had to shift around some things and, and uh, have a little bit more support from AMS uh, going forward into 2020 uh, to cover some of the stuff that uh, the executive director did in the past with the trust. Uh, one of the things we're also working on is if you go to the ITF Trust website, it is a little bit dated. Uh, it, it's under the style of the old ITF website, and when they got when the ITF did their update, they didn't update the trust as well. So we're now underway uh, doing a redesign and a refresh. And that will be revealed later in the year. Uh, it was hopefully going to be re revealed uh, around ITF 107, but other things got very busy, uh, and we were unable to get that done in time. Uh, and the other thing we did get done, though, is the 2020 budget for the ITF Trust is finalized. Uh, we were just waiting on the LLC to finalize and publish theirs, which they did, thank thankfully. Uh, and we've now finalized ours, and it's published on the ITF Trust website. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. That takes us to the IETF Administration LLC open microphone session, which will be chaired, I believe, by Jason. Is that right? Sure. We so have we, um, two yeah, people in queue from previously. Great. Uh, who was the first one in queue? Victor. Victor, okay. Victor, go ahead. Yeah, so my question was uh, back to this when Jay was speaking, when um, we when we saw the registration count, I think it was a 703 I saw there, 
we feel was part of is that lower than we had originally anticipated for that meeting and do we feel that the building challenges that we face um uh, would have been part of that numbers I, I i recall north american meetings i thought would be a little higher typically in terms of registry um in-person registrations so that was my original question is do we feel there was a connection there or that was about normal from what we expected so jason i'll pick that one up um the the Initially, um, registrations were tracking our expected number of registrations for a North American meeting, um, but um, it wasn't too far into that when uh, concerns about COVID-19 started to appear and it then deviated from that. So um, uh, my short answer, we know I don't think there are any problems about the venue in that regard. And if it hadn't been for COVID-19, I think we would have been on track for a um, similar North American meeting in terms of registration numbers. Okay, thank you. Okay, and next up, it looked like uh, JCK, which I'm guessing is John Clinton. It is. Um... I had two issues with Jay, and I just settled one of them in Jabber, so I'll, get, <laughs> okay. I'll deal with only the other one. Uh, the uh, the appointment of an anonymous whistleblower channel, which uh, announcement of an anonymous whistleblower channel and a contractor to manage it, uh, came as a surprise to many of us. It's probably a wonderful idea, but it's also a sign that uh, that the LLC, or it looks like a sign that the LLC is evolving in. Uh, in the direction of looking more and more like a corporation rather than the way the IETF is traditionally run, even under the IOAC. Are there more moves like that in plan uh, consistent with your uh, policies coming comment? So this is Jason, I can speak to that. Um, we created a whistleblower policy when we did the open policy consultation um, that was, uh, I think maybe in the, the uh, sort of fall of uh, of last year, um, and so you know through the sort of October through December timeframe, we worked on that. You know, we had the policies that were up on uh, GitHub, and we took questions and comments um, through a, a bunch of different channels. You know, email um, and uh, GitHub itself, and uh, there was a whistleblower policy um, that was part of that. And this is. Um, uh, one of the requirements that we had, um, you know, when we formed, there was a requirement in some of the formation documents for this sort of thing. So it's not necessarily whistleblower policy that is ITF, um, you know, participant-wide, but you can see this on the, uh, the GitHub site. And, uh, you know, really, you know, getting the third party in place was um, just the final step there. And by the way, I should note as well, um, not only was it recommended, but it was required in the, uh, the formation agreement by ISOC. So really what you're seeing is really the net result of us executing on all those requirements and then putting into force the policies that we uh, communicated and developed with the community um, last year. Jason, I, w I wasn't objecting to anything you've done. And I was vaguely aware of that in the fall, although some of us were uh, preoccupied with the IAS at two working group, as you know. Uh, I was asking if there are more things like that in the queue that you can anticipate and could tell us about an outline either uh, either today or on the ITF list? Uh, no, well, there are not any other policy things that are in queue right now. Um, and, uh, you know, as you saw on sort of the list of things we're working on, it, it's really just executing on the, the structure we've already got, you know, figuring out what the sponsorship and fundraising for the future and, and so on and so forth. But um, no, no, no plans for additional policies uh, anytime soon. Um, and as noted, I think the key is just putting everything into force, you know, really making sure that those are real policies and not just paper. Okay, thanks very much. And uh, next up in the queue, do we have Tony, it looks like? Indeed, and uh, in regards to uh, John and maybe a couple of uh, follow-on questions. Uh, one is, uh, what uh, is the uh, ETF uh, LLC doing to ensure it complies with uh, antitrust laws other than having the processes examined by its lawyers? Uh, there is nothing on the ETF website other than the 2012 list archive. 
Uh, second question is, what is the LLC process for addressing conflicts of interest when they're raised? Some of them have been raised but not carried forward, and the reasoning was opaque. Can a uh, clear reporting process be established before the next IETF meeting and transparency around this set up? And then related again to, to transparency, which uh, actually I think follows from uh, John's question about getting uh, uh, better organized. So a few plenaries ago, a question was raised about transparency of uh, area director funding. It was a great idea, had a couple of ADs committed on the spot. Uh, it could be extended to chairs. The IETF chair said it would be looked into. Um, what is the result? That's, uh, that's it. Okay, so I think I, I caught uh, three separate questions there. I had antitrust, some conflict of interest things, and then AD funding. Um, Alyssa, maybe you want to address AD funding first, and then I'll hit antitrust and see why. Sure, yeah, this is Alyssa Cooper. Uh, so where this landed was indeed with the IESG, and it was during the time when the ITF LLC was uh, starting to develop its conflict of interest policy, which I guess Jason will probably speak to next. Um, and our conclusion, I believe, was to uh, see what that looked like. And um, and I think the IAB had the same conclusion. We were all kind of waiting in cascade uh, to see if we could harmonize the policies um, in terms of disclosing uh, people's conflicts, which naturally would um, disclose their main sources of funding. So the LLC completed that a while back, and then the IAB has just completed um, its own, uh, I think, uh, process and published its uh, statement about conflict of interest. And so now uh, the, the ball is in the IESG's court uh, to sort out uh, what we will do and whether we will uh, follow either of them or, or develop our own. So it's still a pending item for the IESG to tackle. So I think um, that may have covered the last two of the three, um, but certainly if there are other CUI concerns, maybe send them over email or something and we can take a look. Um, the first question pertained to antitrust, and um, we have a number of times looked at antitrust and whether we wanted to revisit that. Um, and uh, we did that, oh, I feel like it was in the fourth quarter one last time, and there were a bunch of um, discussions on some uh, email lists, so we had gone back and looked at some archives. Um, and uh, Jay, I think you um, also have been talking to Council about this. Do you want to reply and provide any additional information? Uh, yes, at the um, uh, IETF 106 plenary, a comment was made um, on an open mic session about um, uh, major upcoming antitrust issues that the IETF ought to be aware of. And so um, I asked our council to get in touch with a person directly about that and see if there were any um, specifics that we ought to be aware of. Um, and no specifics emerged, so no further action was taken. Um, our council do keep a watching brief on um, any emerging antitrust issues, but um, otherwise there's nothing else moving on that front. Thank you. Thanks, maybe I can help. Um, I, I, I perform this activity to some extent for the, uh, uh, in conjunction with, uh, with Etsy. And uh, as some of you know, I funded uh, the Internet Society, the first uh, review of this. Uh, arguably, there's a continuing problem that could, could get worse. Hi, this is uh, Greg Wood, and I'm going to just uh, jump in to manage the queue for this uh, part of the session. Um, could uh, whoever was just speaking say their name? I didn't catch it. Sorry, Tony Kowski. Okay, thank you, Tony. Um, so, looking uh, at the WebEx chat, where if you want to indicate uh, joining the queue, just uh, type plus Q. Um, I see next um, Karen O'Donoghue, who's bringing a question from the Jabber room. Karen? Uh, 
Yes, the question was, what was the target date for a go, no go decision for IETF 108, or is there one? Ah, well, that's a that's an excellent question, um, and um, I'm not certain that there is a definite date as yet. Um, Jay, do you want to speak to that based on your discussions with the secretariat and so on? I, you know, I think at a high level, I would say, you know, we were trying to sort of get through this meeting first, and then based on what we learned, do a pretty major reassessment. But Jay, what would you like to add since you've been so intensively working with the secretariat on, on these issues? Yeah, so uh, this is, um, to be clear, a conversation uh, across the LLC Secretariat and the IESG. Um, and so far, no, we do not have a target date. Um, we are, as Jason said, we want to get through this meeting. We are reaching out to various people that we need to speak to, hosts, sponsors, and those sorts of people. And um, uh, trying to work backwards from the time so that we understand uh, the implications better. Um, and so um, that's going to be quite intense uh, work as soon as this meeting finishes, and then we'll hopefully have a better idea within a week or two from there. Okay. Uh, I see next Larry in the queue. Larry? I just want to urge you to do contingency planning for the possibility. I'm sorry, Larry, could I ask you to say your full name, please? Larry Macinter. Thank you. I'd like to ask you to do contingency planning for the possibility that face to face meetings won't be possible in the foreseeable future just because of uh, uh, travel restrictions. And add that to your list of contingencies. Thank you, Larry. I'll pick up on that. Yes, we do do that. Um, we are doing that contingency planning. Um, this, of course, is the, the first time this has happened. So, um, and the, the LRC is relatively new. So, there is no existing um, thorough contingency plan in this regard. But that is something that we and the ISG are working together on and will be developing over time, certainly. And I would just add um, from the mailing list discussion about this question as well, it's certainly important that as those come together in draft form that they're shared um, for uh, community comment and you know get the benefit of uh, you know a lot of people taking a look at them and commenting. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see Pete Resnick in the queue next. Pete. Um, hi, uh, and you can hear me. Uh, so, going back to this question of antitrust, I just wanted to get the order of how things happened. Someone brought up a comment at IETF 106 that this should be looked into. Um, who directed uh, legal counsel to go look into this? Um, I'll pick that up, Pete. So, um, that was a comment made um, uh, from the open mic session, and so I did. Um, I instructed our council to speak to that person so that we could understand what they were talking about and understand what they were saying, um, because they were suggesting that there was some new legislation or something else coming that was going to be a problem. Um, and so that's the conversation that we had, um, a fact gathering information, but no facts were gathered, no um, information came from that, and so it stopped at that point. Okay, and my, my concern being, of course, any policy around uh, antitrust or anything else for that matter would go over to the ISG. Um, it, it wouldn't be in scope for the LLC to take that on, correct? I um, I believe that's the case. Well, I believe it's a it's it's an issue for both organisations because I believe the LLC carries the legal liability um, or some legal liability in this case. And so it is something that needs to be worked across both organizations. But in terms of substantive issues around it, yes, we would defer to the ISG on that. And our role is to ensure that we have the information there that we can present the options, we can do the research, you know, so that the ISG doesn't have to um, uh, become lawyers. Thanks. 
Okay, I don't see anybody else in the queue. So uh, Jason, Jay, I think it's back to you. Great, thank you. If there are no more questions, then I think we are done with our session. Great, thank you. We can move on. So, uh, moving on to the Internet Engineering Steering Group. Next slide, please. So this time around, we have uh, five area directors who we are saying uh, goodbye and thank you to. Um, the outgoing members are uh, Ignis Bagdonas, who was uh, two years as the management area director, uh, Suresh Krishnan, who spent four years as internet area director uh, and handled, among other things, uh, many a difficult conflict review um, as well as some uh, proposals for new and different versions of IP. Um, so always um, interesting and uh, challenges in the internet area. Uh, we're also saying goodbye and thanks to uh, Miria Kulvind, spent four years as a, the transport AD, uh, one of the people who helped uh, bring us uh, <laughs> the working group that has eaten up a lot of the IETF, also known as QUIC. Uh, she's not going far though, as she's moving on to become a member of the IAB and, in fact, the IAB chair. Alexei Melnikov, who spent four years as Art AD and um, had also previously served a two-year term as, uh, as App AD when we had the App area. Um, so he is the longest serving member to be uh, stepping down this time and we'll certainly miss his, um, his wisdom <laughs> derived from uh, longevity. And finally, Adam Roach, who spent three years as Art AD and um, to his credit, that infamous cluster 238 of documents related to WebRTC got into RFC editor processing uh, just before he is, is stepping down. So he uh, dealt with many of those documents, but um, will not be dealing with Auth48. <laughs> we'll pass that uh, token on to, uh, to his successor. Next slide, please. So typically, this would be the point in the in-person plenary where um, the outgoing ADs would ceremoniously pass their badge dots to the incoming ADs. And uh, sadly, we're not co-located, so we can't physically pass the dots, but now we can all think about um, <laughs> how the dots might be flying through the air, through the internet, um, uh, on your screen. So that's, that's the dot passing portion. You can go to the next slide, please. And now we are ready for IESG open mic. And you can see uh, these are the folks uh, outgoing, continuing, and incoming IESG. We are not going to do the round of um, introductions that we would normally do uh, given the audio setup, uh, but you can see our faces and, and read our names on the slide. So the queue is open. Hey, Michael Richardson. Hi. So I wanted to know, uh, get some an update on the openstand.org effort and whether this is still an IESG project or what exactly. Yes. Thank you, Michael. And thank you for submitting your question in advance. Um, so the OpenStand uh, project specifies some uh, uh, principles uh, that open standards organizations uh, abide by for those who aren't familiar with it. And um, if you look at the OpenStand website, you can see that the web pre presence has been archived. Um, so the principles are there. Uh, they're continuing to remain up on the site um, for people to reference um, and understand um, and potentially to use again in the future. Um, but there's not any active promotion um, that is going on right now. Uh, it's an effort that we uh, engaged in together with other standards development organizations and with ISOC, and we're still obviously coordinating with um, with those bodies. 
um, but there isn't any um, you know, active development or promotion of the principles uh, at this point. Does that answer the question? Mm, so there's no plans to go forward with it? Uh, I mean, I'm not sure what you mean by going forward, but um, they're, the principles are there to be used by uh, people who need them, but we're not actively doing anything with them right now. Okay, thanks. Okay, next in queue, we have Tony Witkowski. Hello again. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one relates to uh, particularly the relationships with other uh, SDOs. I was wondering what uh, concrete steps have been taken to address, uh, if you will, the com competition that's sort of taking place amongst the SDOs and the potential attrition of newcomers and diverse stakeholders. Um, and uh, that that's related to, uh, in some cases, a kind of a hot, hostile atmosphere that uh, yeah, ETF also has compared to other SDOs. Um, second question is, I'm not sure whether it's uh, my ESG or IAB, but it has to do with lawful interception. That's likely to become increasingly important. Uh, will a position paper be uh, prepared on that, or is uh, everyone so intransigent on the subject that that's not likely to occur? Thanks, Tony. Um, let's take the second one first. Do we have a security AD who wants to talk about lawful intercept? Um, Tony, uh, this is Roman. I, I guess uh, we would like to better kind of understand what kind of position paper and for whom we, you'd like us to publish that on. Uh, right, and this is Ben, because we already have RFC 2804 that you as far as I can tell, is on the same topic. Well, there has been an RFC. This has, of course, been an ongoing controversy going back into the into the 1990s uh, when uh, when Clio was first passed and its uh, counterparts in Europe and other places. Um, and uh, the I'm aware of the RFC, but it's not clear basically who would have the ball here of ever changing the position. Whether it would be the IESG or IAB, or whether it's possible to do a position paper. I mean, I'm, I'm not seeing any incentive or desire from the community to reopen the established consensus. I, I, I don't think there's anything to do here. There's no one to have the ball. Okay, uh, although uh, you uh, you are aware, perhaps particularly with respect to 5G that the uh, FCC asserted that as a requirement for all 5G implementations. So um, that's uh, going to be quite interesting and definitely raises the issue again, particularly with respect to whether the uh, IETF uh, is going to do anything in the 5G world. Okay, thank you. Thanks. And I think on the the question about um, how do we work with other SDOs, um, as is the case with many things in the IETF, we tend to take a, a bottom-up approach. So um, the most useful thing that we do, I think, or the most fruitful is that we um, we collaborate with individuals who are working uh, across SDOs to make sure that our um, work aligns uh, and um, that the uh, adjacencies are aligned between the work that we're doing and the work that other SDOs are doing. So having people who are um, you know, participating in multiple bodies who can um, translate back and forth in terms of what the requirements are and what the interfaces are between our protocols and the standards that are being produced elsewhere um, is always, I think, the most Im important thing um, that we do at the bottom. And then um, building up from there, we have liaison managers who uh, manage the relationships um, across the board between 
the, the work of the IETF and, and working groups that are relevant um, and um, other SDOs. And then um, the IAB has a uh, responsibility for shepherding um, those liaison managers, um, checking in with them, making sure that the relationships are, um, are solid. With some of the groups that we engage with on a more frequent basis, um, we uh, have also some leadership coordination. So with IEEE 802, for example, um, we have an ongoing uh, communications channel. Um, we have regular sync ups where we um, go through a shared list of um, items of interest and make sure, you know, try to make sure that we maintain alignment and find people who can contribute on one side or the other who might not be aware of, of new work that's coming into either body. So. Um, in specific cases, we, we make it a little bit more high touch, but that's the general approach that we take to uh, working with other SDOs. And then we send liaison statements just like every other SDO, but we we tend to prefer, um, you know, more informal communication and, um, you know, just getting people working together as opposed to these formal liaison statements, unless we really have to. Just a final comment. That sounds like a great idea. Um, and I think it's going to be, again, uh, in the 5G world is going to be increasingly important with respect to 3GPP and the whole constellation of bodies uh, that are involved in that effort. So uh, is the, the extent you can be proactive and informal, that's great. Yeah, absolutely. And um, 3GPP as well is one of those where we have um, a, a sort of standing mechanism for coordination and a mailing list uh, where in a bunch of interested individuals, not just the liaison manager, um, are involved. Um, I know that tends to revolve around an in-person uh, lunch meeting, uh, so we might need to, you know, change that up a little bit as things go forward. Um, but that's another one that we've uh, we've we've tried to be a little bit more hands-on with. Thanks. So I think we have <laughs> Torless. Sorry, so for, uh, killed by a WebEx feature. You can just um, yeah state your full name for the. For the taker. Um, I was uh, you know uh, I would like to ask the um, ISG to you know come up with um, you know some hopefully more liberal um, you know guidance for the ability to use the um, ITF tools when doing you know virtual site meetings you know in the same way that uh, rooms uh, were usable in the physical meetings. Uh, I think it would be great if that would apply to the wiki, the Java, the Etherpad, maybe the uh, the WebEx, right? When we're doing virtual meetings, because right now there is no statements about that. And rather, one would fear not to use an Etherpad or um, a wiki or so to to organize uh, such unofficial site meetings. And obviously, WebEx and uh, Jabber wouldn't be usable by themselves right now at all. Thank you for the question. I'm sorry for the delay. Normally I can like look people in the eye and, and see who wants to answer. They raise their hand and we're having to do it by a jabber. So it takes a little bit longer. Um, I think uh, at the moment and as, as previewed earlier in the plenary, uh, we have been focusing on, on in the short order, what can we do to make this uh, particular meeting go off smoothly? We have a lot of decisions uh, that need to be made about uh, how we run things going forward. And so um, this is, you know, the, the question about side meetings is something that we will um, need to tackle. Uh, but it's not, it's not something that we've, we've really had time to discuss in the context of, you know, many, many more um, virtual meetings that are happening. Um, but I think Suresh has more to say about that. So I'll let, I'll let Suresh uh, follow up. Yeah, thanks, Torlis. I think uh, when we originally started off with the side meetings, the intent was to clearly delineate the meetings from the official meetings because it was easy for people outside the IETF to confuse them. And that's why we decided, like, you know, this is not something uh, we wanted to encourage at that time. As like Alisa said, like, you know, the times are changing and probably something we need to look at, but that's the original um reason why we didn't uh, do specific uh, remote support for this yeah thanks completely understood and it wasn't a complaint so i completely understand that this uh, couldn't have been you know anywhere on the top of priority up so far but towards 108 it would be great to 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 give it thoughts and definitely i think there should be a clear distinction so people won't confuse Thanks. I think we have Stuart next. 
Um, I'm not sure whether people in other areas feel the same, but as a long term control, I get the impression that security reviews are something akin to a gen art review by someone who knows a bit about security. They're not. Uh, at least in my experience, a review by someone who is a specialist at both security and uh, routing. Now, this leads to a great deal of frustration and a great deal of time spent educating the reviewer on things that we take as read in the routing area. It also, I believe, ultimately leads to a reduction in the quality of the security reviews, because if you know about both subjects, you would be able to, to drill down on what's really important and um, not sort of apply a, a standard rote to what to look for. So can I ask the security ADs to look at either uh, training some of their uh, reviewers in routing or recruiting uh, some extra reviewers um, who are skilled in both subjects or training some routing specialists in sufficient security that they're confident that they would understand the security issues in routing uh, drafts. Uh, hi Stuart, so this is Ben Kaduk. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I actually really appreciate one of your suggestions in there to try and train some people who are existing routing experts in security issues and would love to talk to any volunteers who want to come forward and uh, get some training in that regard. Uh, I think the topic of assigning reviewers to documents to review uh, and what policy to use when doing that has come up actually several times in our security directorate meetings in the context of do we want to specifically find people who are domain experts versus doing a more round robin style assignment where you might get someone who has no background knowledge in the area. And pretty universally, the consensus of the directorate has been that the round robin assignment is better because you can get someone who has a completely fresh perspective. Uh, and you know, yes, sometimes it will be difficult for the reviewer uh, and they might have to put some extra work in to learn the topic and they might come out a little confused sometimes, but you also do get the really invaluable benefit that sometimes you have someone with a, a fresh perspective who can find things that are totally uh, not visible to people who already have the domain expertise. And we think that the sort of uh, benefits from having the fresh perspective uh, outweighs the cost of, you know, sometimes not having as good of a review or having to do a little bit of uh, training for the review. Um, and I guess this is not directly responding to your particular question, but I think it's sort of a, a related topic that uh, that comes up in many of the routing drafts, which is that, you know, from me as the AD and, and the directorate, we really want to make sure that the security properties of the protocol as a whole, including say whatever extension is, is in the draft under question, as well as the core protocol, we want to make sure that the security properties are well documented. Uh, and that's sort of one of the key things that we're looking for when we do the director review. And if there's you know, an existing reference that has the security considerations for the base protocol, that's amazing. We love to see that, um, whether that's in the, the specification of the core protocol or a separate document. Uh, but unfortunately for many of the existing and sort of legacy protocols that the security considerations in the core protocol spec are kind of inadequate and there hasn't been a, a follow-up standalone document for the security considerations. And so in many cases, a lot of the fundamental security considerations are just not written down anywhere. And so when we're doing the direct reviews, we need to have this discussion about, okay, well, what is the best path towards getting these security considerations really documented properly? A lot of the time, that's not going to be document all of the considerations of the base protocol in the document for the specific extension. Uh, but I think that's still a discussion worth having and uh, in the process of having the discussion with the review thread, uh, we can get a better handle and even start to write down what some of those considerations are. And so while I sympathize with your frustration, um, I do think that we should try and always look for the path towards the, the best outcome in the future. Well, I certainly think we need to look for a path to get the best outcome, no question about uh, that. Um, I think you quite often reviewers fail to understand the sort of 
fundamental knowledge that you need just to go to the party in some of your TikToks and fail to recognize that actually a lot of these networks are uh, pretty secure because they're some of the, uh, the hottest areas to attack. And operators have a long, long history of securing their networks. I also kind of feel that the, the, the expectation of the review team is that we um, write the document for the complete novice instead of um, assuming that someone needs a certain level of experience to, uh, to even begin to read the document. Uh, and I think that's very reasonable. I think if you're writing a modification or an extension to a complex protocol, um, you should you should be assumed that you know all about that protocol before you even start to pick up the new document. Uh, I, I think that's that's generally the case to be able to assume a reasonable level of familiarity familiarity with the base specification uh, to work on an extension. But I think it still needs to be uh, documented in terms of some some reference or initial statement that you know. We rely on this base specification, so if you're confused by what you read here, you should go read this other document. Of course, not in those words. Um, and I don't remember specific cases of this off the top of my head to really be, be able to comment more. I would actually like to, um, here's Mia Kuhlman. I would actually like to add a little bit more a general note, um, because for us, having the directorates and getting these reviews in is very valuable. I think in general, getting more reviews for the documents is, is a plus. Um, and this is a service to the community. So I'm very thankful for, for people doing this and volunteering and spending their time on, on reviewing these documents. It is challenging to review a document from a different area where you're not an expert. It is a, a lot of time commitment if you actually have to look up background. Um, and it's also hard sometimes to find the right tone. But in general, I think all these reviews and all the comments are meant to actually improve the outcome of the document. And I hope that people can also receive it that way and try to be constructive and, and try to take into account that somebody reviewing this from a different expertise is trying to bring in its own expertise and cannot be an expert of the protocol that the person is reviewing. But at the end, the goal really is to improve the protocol, to improve the document and to improve the RFC um, series. Thank you. I don't see anybody else in the queue. So this is the last call to get into the queue to ask the ISG. Okay. I should say that we um, we invited questions in advance. We got one from Michael Richardson, which we spoke about at the at the beginning of the open mic. We got a second question. Um, which was more of an LLC question, so we uh, we directed it over to Jay. Uh, but in the future, we would be happy to receive questions in advance of the open mic as well. And with that, I think, oh, we have Tony back in queue. Go ahead. Oh, plus one or plus Q, Tony? <laughs> I thought it would be different. Uh, just to say, it's, okay. it's been a pleasure to be here and involved again. And I was reflecting, I think the last time I was on an open mic, to, uh, the group was in 1994 as a ISOC executive director trying to convince the uh, ETF to have a relationship with the I, with uh, with the uh, Internet Society. So uh, 25 years later, uh, things have changed a little bit. Great. Thanks for your participation. I think we can move on to the IAB. I think, Ted, are you going to open up? Over to Miria from here on out. I believe we have the recognition first, which uh, you might want to start with. Uh, well, I'd have to recognize myself, but I think I know myself. I kind of shape myself <laughs> well, we every day. We can recognize you at the very end. If you recognize the other people, that would be helpful. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, these are the outgoing IEB members. So you'll notice this is a very large crop. I think uh, this is an entire turnover of an IEB uh, class, which is an unusual thing. Um, I just wanted to, to reach out to each of you and to say thank you for your service. Uh, Christian Wietema, I think you, you were with us. 
uh, a fairly short period of time this this go round, but have the longest history in the IEB. Uh, Eric, I think you're the longest serving uh, uh, of this of this particular group. Uh, Melinda, you are certainly the farthest away, having often come to us from uh, latitudes at, at least uh, 40 degrees away from us in some cases. Uh, Martin, you're the other direction, the farthest away south, the farthest away north. In all things, it was, it was a great subject. And uh, to see again with other dots, but passion. So this is. This is Alyssa Cooper again. Uh, Ted, we, we're not going to just let you recognize yourself. So I just wanted to also um, say a huge thank you to you. Um, Ted has been the IAB chair for the last three years, which is actually um, a, a longer tenure than has been uh, uh, has been standard in, in recent times. Uh, and it's a difficult job. Um, it's uh, it's uh, unrelenting and um, the collection of tasks involved in the IAB is uh, is varied and um, can incur, uh, you know, lots of uh, challenging conversations um, with the community and um, uh, and challenges for the internet itself. And I will just say that uh, personally, I've really valued your uh, leadership um, uh, and uh, companionship uh, in in the journey here. So thank you for for all of your efforts. And now it's over to Miria. Yeah, thank you a lot, Ted, and thank you for all the other IAB members. Um, so at this point, I'm happy that I can take over and I would like to take like one or two minutes to just introduce myself and also say thank you for um, selecting me and trusting in me to serving in this position. Um, that's mainly for the IAB who selected me, but also to the community because um, the community in NOMCOM, they actually gave me the opportunity to um, go directly from the ISG into the IAB, which is already rare, rare. And then it's even more rare um, to start as the IAB chair in this position. Um, the reason why I uh, can do this is because I was already the liaison from the ISG to the IAB, so I at least know what's going on <laughs> and I'm confident I can serve in this position. However, I'm also aware um, that uh, it's, it's not easy to transition from one position into the um, other directly. Um, so I'm very open for, and I will be try to be careful about being clear in what role I'm talking. Um, I would be um, grateful for any kind of feedback or comments people have to me um, in general. Um, so in, with that in mind, I basically would like to um, um, open the open mic. And I think we have another slide where we show the whole set of IB members, right? Um, so as I said, I think uh, I'm, I'm very open for any kind of feedback. I think uh, for us as a community, as a consensus driven community, it's very important that people speak up uh, and uh, say their opinion. I know that not all the topics are always interested for everybody, but uh, especially when it's process topics or these kind of things. But you know, if you're actively actively working in the IDTF, you should care about it. You should have an opinion, and um, so I'd be very happy to take some questions. Uh, we have on the open mic now the whole incoming and outgoing IAB, and we also have uh, John Levine here as the temporary RFC series manager, so if you, if you have questions for him. And that opens the open mic. And we have Tony again. Uh, thank you. My uh, regards to uh, Christian. Um, I uh, pass his old home in uh, Sufi Antipolis uh, every other month going to Etsy meetings, which gets to my question. Uh, Etsy has uh, instituted a, uh, a change uh, that to attract uh, diversity and more people by uh, creating these uh, informal groups where it doesn't actually require message uh, memberships. In some ways, it's a little bit like the uh, ETF. So I was wondering whether there was some way through the IAB, perhaps, or uh, another appropriate mechanism to get more collaboration uh, between uh, with the uh, new um, 
um, uh, ISGs that are being created uh, for which I think there would be a, a common interest in, uh, in utility. So um, thank you. Um, I, I have to say I'm personally not aware about these Etsy groups, um, but we do have a liaison with Etsy. So I think that's something we could look at. Um, and, I, and we also have a liaison manager for Etsy. So maybe that person, if it's knowledge about, about can speak up. Or actually, I just figured we might not have a liaison with Etsy. So maybe that's the first step to consider here, actually. Yeah, there's a there's an agreement, uh, uh, basically, for for kind of uh, communication and sharing, which, but uh, it, it's, it, it could be uh, improved. And particularly with this kind of sea change of creating these, uh, these ISGs and trying to broaden the participation and diversity. Um, it's something we could, that brings us uh, uh, into kind of more of a common interest. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll, at my end, since I'm also the liaison to some other groups, uh, I'll see what I can do to facilitate that. Okay, thank you very much. And then the next one in the queue is Dominique. Hi, Dominique Glazansky. Um, I have a couple of uh, Model T program, which I'm a part of, which I'm very we're excited about, but um, it's an IAB program that was recently set up, and I was just curious about what the process is for getting that program um, up, you know, and with that, and and if you need to be on the IAB to get an IAB pro program running, uh, and yeah, and that's all. I just wanted to ask um, to see how that whole process works. Thanks. Um, so, um, I can, I can already, uh, answer part of your question and there will be other IAB members who are more in touch with the uh, multi program who can give you more information. But 1 part is that this program, it has an open membership. Everybody can contribute and everybody can engage uh, in the discussion. Um, it's different than what we usually have as programs, but there is also a discussion ongoing in the IAB about how we want to organize programs in future for this program. It's open. Um. I'm not sure if Stephen or Yari want to add some more here. Hi, Stephen here. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm afraid, Dominic, I, I missed a part of the question because of some audio drops. But uh, yeah, the, the program is open. And uh, I, uh, yeah, maybe if you could repeat the question, I might be able to actually give you an answer. Actually, I'm asking um, about like future IAB programs, like if let's say I wanted to set one up and I'm not on the IAB, how I would go about doing that, or if that's even a, a possibility in terms of how you set, how it's set up, if that makes sense. I'm not talking about Model T in particular because I'm excited about that and it's moving forward, but just in general about the process. Thanks. Uh, okay. Okay, I got the question. It sounds like I'm off the hook, uh, which is good. Uh, I, I guess the IAB kind of. If, from my point of view, if somebody has an interesting thing that they want to talk about, I'll happily talk to them. And if you know, I think it was something worth bringing up with the IAB, I would do that. And then the IAB would decide to pursue it or not. So I guess it's it's that sort of semi-formal thing that's pretty normal. Uh, maybe other people want to answer, but that, that's how I would view it. Um, yeah, I mean, as I said already, um, the, the idea about the IAB programs was um, a, a tool to help the IAB to do technical um, work and have discussion with not only IAB members, but also expert, experts uh, from outside the IAB. So that's the whole idea about it. But as I said already, we're also discussing internally how we want to um, organize programs in future, and probably there will be a change in the in the next coming months and years. Yeah, this is Yari. I just wanted to add that there's um difference between different programs of course that some like if you're managing a relationship somewhere maybe a little bit more close nature but uh when it's a sort of a broader issue in the internet like the model t is, is one example of that and steve and i at least felt that that's it's really important to have have open participation and uh sort of community engagement 
and and it can of course go in multiple different directions that somebody can get excited in the community that hey we have this issue why don't we do something IAV and then hopefully the IAV will also go along with that depending on you know their opinions Any question, Dominique? Yeah, uh, thanks. And I might follow up offline anyway, because it's so late where I am. So <laughs> thanks again. Sure, <laughs> thank you. So next one in the queue is Larry. I don't have a last name, so maybe you state your name. Hi, this is Larry Messenger. Uh, I wanted to take the opportunity to advertise the W3C community group that I would like more IETF participation in uh, for helping people going uh, suddenly going going online where to find resources. It wasn't uh, and what how to how to uh, uh, technically especially technical advice of what kind of bandwidth you need and and those kinds of things to coordinate best practices. Anyway, uh, I should put the URL for the group in the uh, Jabber room. So thank you. Thank you, Larry. And then we have uh, Simon Hicks. Hi, I'm Simon Hicks. Um, I just wanted uh, to note as the past uh, chairman of Etsy um, about the comment on Jabba that we're not a regional organization. We have um, members from 80 countries of the world, a lot of which are outside Europe. Yes, we have Europe in the title. That doesn't make us a regional organization. Um, we operate um, from globally. Thank you. Thank you for this note. So that's the current end of our queue. We will wait a few more seconds. Um, and with this, I will hand back to Alyssa. Thanks. Uh, that takes us to the end of the plenary. So thanks to everyone for uh, for joining and we'll see you online for the rest of the sessions this week. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Thanks. Bye, everybody.